This is the Be Helpful Podcast, where conversations with budding entrepreneurs prepare you for the wild journey of building a business or side hustle. Welcome back. Uh, today, I sit down with Brian Moon. He's the founder of The Moon Group um, at Keller Williams One Chicago. A uh, good family friend, um, but I'm so lucky because he's also one of the top real estate agents in Chicago and recognized nationwide. Um, a very influential broker in, in Chicago. He not only sells homes, uh, sells and buys homes, but he also has extensive experience with general construction um, and, and project development. And we get to see a little backdrop of his beautiful home. Brian, how's it going? <laughs> good, good, buddy. Good to be here. Uh, thanks for the kind words. Thanks for the opportunity to uh, talk with you today. Absolutely. So I, I like starting this off with kind of a fun question. Um, what did you want to be growing up? I mean, two things always come to the top of my head when I think about this. Uh, professional soccer player. Uh, that was my passion growing up, soccer. Um, played a little bit in Europe when I was a teenager uh, in England. And then I uh, lived over there for a little bit. And then uh, probably an actor. Hmm. Always, I, always, I did a little acting in college. Uh, I was always, uh, you know, um, not my forte. I would, don't think I was really good at it. Um, I was so insecure about it. So I just was like, uh, I'm out of here. But I think those two things, if I could do it over again, I'd work, work a little harder at soccer so I could actually make it because I was pretty close uh, going to the big time. And then uh, acting, I probably would have just stuck with it. Nice. nice. Yeah. So, so looking back kind of, over your career, where do you think becoming a real estate, uh, getting into the real estate business came from um, after, you know, uh, your soccer career ended and then also you decided you didn't want to be an actor anymore? Yeah. Um, well, I used to be an option trader uh, at the CBOE, uh, uh -huh. Chicago Board of Option Exchange. Uh, I started as a runner um, when I was like probably 19 years old. So I dropped out of full-time college, uh, went uh, part-time to night school, and then worked full-time down at the Board of Trade. So um, I did that for about two and a half years. Uh, eventually started trading at the Option Exchange. But my godfather, my, who's also my cousin, uh, was a big-time real, realtor here, investor, home builder. And he was like, hey, man, you're good, at, you're good with numbers. You're good with people. Uh, you would crush it in this game. Uh, and I was like, nah, nah, I don't want to be a realtor. Like, they're just like one step above a car salesman, you know? And I was like, <laughs> not going to be me, you know? I got, I'm sure I'm good with people, but I, I don't want to sell anybody anything. Uh, yeah. And then I worked, uh, eventually, you know, the trading uh, came to an end. Uh, I got fired, um, not for job performance, but uh, at the time I lived an hour and 40 minutes northwest of Chicago. So wow. I was waking up at 4.30 in the morning to catch a 5.15 train to get to downtown by like 7 something. And uh, it was, I did that for about two years, almost two and a half years. And I think I ended up missing the train like six times. And those are six times I was late. And uh, <laughs> I worked for a specialty firm out of Amsterdam called Tag Vandermolen. And these guys mm. were all like Harvard, Stanford, you know, uh, some of the top schools in Britain, all graduates. They're very analytical, very high performers. Uh, and here I am with a high school degree, no college degree, taking <laughs> night school, you know, kind of, uh, you know, just grunt. But I had a, I had a good, you know, head on my shoulders and uh, I worked hard. Um, and so they liked a lot of things about me. But eventually they were like, hey, man, you can't keep showing up late. Like this is your final warning. I missed a train ride. If you miss one train out there, you have to wait 15 to 25 minutes for the next train. Yeah. And uh, eventually they're like, hey, sorry, we're going to have to let you go. Uh, we gave you enough warnings. And I literally packed up my office because uh, at the time I was 20, 21. I had my own office. I was oh, wow. making really good money, uh, more money than both my parents combined. You know, And uh I called up my godfather and said, Hey, do you still want to, uh, you still want me to come work for you? You still want me to, you know, sling real estate? And he's like, absolutely. So I literally took my box full of stuff from my office, got on the Metro line, got off at the Clybourne stop in Bucktown, walked two blocks to his office. And that was the first day I started in real estate. 
I was 21 mm-hmm. years old. I'm 43 now. So uh, mm-hmm. I fell in love with just the way he ran his business and the way he treated people. It, it was the opposite of what a car salesman does. Um, yeah. He really uh, had the platinum rule, you know, right? Not just treat yeah. people the way you want to be treated, but uh, he also really led with integrity. And that yeah. was one thing that I was kind of like, oh, okay, so you're never trying to sell anybody anything. And he was like, no, I'm here to consult, educate, and teach people what I know. And I really, yeah. li- I really, that really kind of um, held true to what my heart kind of, what the way I feel led. I feel like I have a, a gift uh, to serve. You know, it doesn't yeah. matter what it is. Uh, I've I've coached soccer at the collegiate level, uh, won f- three national championships. On the kind wow. of college coach, uh, I've been a sailboat instructor here at Belmont Harbor, teaching adults how to sail. Like I just love to teach in some ways, um, mm. and because uh, I grew up sailing. But the real estate was great because you not only make uh, you have the opportunity to really help people and protect their largest asset, which generally is their their, their home, uh, but you also have an opportunity to make good money while doing it. And so for me, it was something that. Uh, I just came natural to Uh, having an analytical background, being a numbers guy, understanding the economy, understanding uh, just the way, you know, fundamentals of the economy work and how that impacts real estate investments uh, was a natural shoe in for me to have conversations with investors, uh, Mm -hmm. with developers, and ultimately with consumers who are, you know, a large portion of our, our consumers, like our clients are first time home buyers. Yeah. So these are, you know, you've gone through the process of buying a condo. It's, you know, you don't know what you don't know, just like anything else in life. So yeah. <laughs> for me, it was just a no brainer. I fell in love with it and I haven't really looked back and now I'm celebrating my 19th year of doing it full time. That's amazing. No, that's, that's awesome. Uh, you know, in college, I uh, work for a property management company and I was a leasing consultant and Coming out of college, I always said I wanted to go into real estate because of the, there was something special about helping people find where they're going to live. Hmm. Now, granted, I was just doing it with college kids, yeah. but something so personal yeah. and something so impactful to them, yeah. uh, it was just very rewarding. And so, um, you know, I, I very much understand that draw to this is one of the most impactful ways that you can help someone because it is probably going to be their biggest asset, um, you know, in their lifetime or one of the biggest assets in their lifetime. So it makes sense. All of those skill sets coming together and how you wanted to help people. Yeah. I like that. I met with a couple last night, uh, who I've been working for two years to try to get in front of, right. Mm -hmm. They were a lead from, you know, uh, a software company that I've hired to drum up leads. And mm-hmm. I've just followed through, followed, followed up, followed back. And uh, last night we have actually had a, a Zoom call to kind of talk about the buying process. And what I loved about it was, you know, they've been following me for two years, kind of seeing the houses I sell, seeing kind of the stuff we put on social media, stuff we do for our community. And they were just kind of like, uh, you, we, were, we were totally sold on you, right? Yeah. And it was just like, it's affirmation. But the thing I loved most about it was like, hey guys, what I'm going to teach you over this this process of buying your first condo together is going to be useful for the rest of your life. Right. And you will actually one day, you know, Lord willing have kids and you're going to teach them. Right. So my legacy or my impact will go a lot farther than just helping, um, you know, helping uh, a bank make more money or an investor make more money. Yeah. Right. Where it's just a a number on a piece of paper. Yeah. No, man. I, I love that. I love it. So, so one, one question I do have is, okay, you're in the real estate business. What made you want to take the next step to have your own kind of practice, your own firm within the real estate business rather than just being an agent under a broader umbrella? Yeah. Well, I think uh, real estate is a grind, right? Real estate brokerage is a grind. You got to work hard. It's a sales, it's hundred percent commission. Um, it's a juxtaposition of obviously you don't make money until people spend money. Right. Yeah. And so it can be a very lonely game because there is a lot of rejection. There's a lot of failure and you just have to constantly pick yourself up. Right. Whether it's yeah. early in your career, you might make a mistake here or there and you might 
burn a bridge because you just didn't know what you were potentially doing to the yeah. best of your abilities. Obviously, that doesn't happen anymore. But you know, you always work better when you're in groups. I when I first started, I worked for my godfather, who was a top producer um, at a company called uh, App Properties, uh, our property consultants, and then went to App Properties. Uh, mm-hmm. And then I was on a big uh, producing team, a top three team in the city of Chicago. So every year they they were in the top three. So they were doing a hundred million a year um, back in the was it early two thousands, right? Mm-hmm. Now the top teams are doing two to three hundred million, right? So mm-hmm. it's a lot bigger now. But back then, a hundred million was like the ultimate goal, right? Yeah. And so. What I what I liked about those was I learned what to do right and what I, what I learned to do what not to do, mm-hmm. right. So that's either the way they consulted their clients, the way maybe um, in real estate, probably just like in any other kind of sales. And this is where it kind of comes back to that whole car salesman thing. Was uh, I always try? I already knew maybe it was because the way I was raised or because uh, some of the mentors I had early on in the industry were like, don't see how close you could get to the line of of being questionable, but like how far can you stay from that line? Mm -hmm. And so I bring this up because what I saw from other brokers was they would try to get close to that line. Mm -hmm. Right. And maybe they, they have little white lies or they fib right on something or they expand on something that really shouldn't be expanded on. Right. Just to add dramatic effect in order to have power over the opposite party. Mm -hmm. Right to, you know, hinder the negotiation or to put pressure where there was no pressure, but they were just kind of lying. And so for me, it was like, okay, this, I don't really know if I want to be associated with these people anymore. So then I went to another group and then another top producer, right? So my first like three or four years, I was with a top producing team. And then the next like eight years, I was with another top producer, kind of a luxury agent. So I kind of learned, cut my teeth a little bit on luxury properties uh, here in Chicago. And she was a very integrous person. So she yeah. ran a business that I always admired. And I was like, Oh, I want to run a business like this. Right. But yeah. I think I could still do it better. Right. Because right. of my analytical background, my, you know, uh, non-conforming kind of thinking outside the box. Uh, how do I find leverage within a negotiation or how do I, you know, create opportunities for people out of mm-hmm. nothing? You know, for example, I just sent like 1,200 letters to all the single family home owners in one particular neighborhood because I have three or four buyers who are really desperate to find something in this neighborhood and there's nothing on the market. Or when something mm. does come on the market, it's way overpriced, right. right? So just like taking that initiative, taking that idea, oh, well, how do I, all right, now with my team, let's figure out how we could execute on this, right? Yeah. And then go out and do it. And so I came over to Keller Williams from Berkshire Hathaway Spent about 15 years um, with a company called uh, Caning and Stray, which was a luxury brokerage here in Chicago. Uh, And then we got bought out by Berkshire Hathaway. And um, about four years ago, I switched over to Keller Williams because one thing I wasn't getting after having 15, 16 years of experience at a big brokerage was um, I wasn't, I was kind of stagnant. Right. Mm. You learn every deal, every, every year, every deal is different. Right. So you're always learning something, but I wasn't expanding my ability to think bigger, right. Mm. To expand, right. Like how do I actually run a business? Because I was an advantageous realtor. Most realtors don't treat their business like a business. Mm. And that is the most common mistake I see in the, you know, cause all realtors generally, unless you work for like Redfin where you get a salary, you are a 1099. 100% 100% commission broker, right? Right. And so the thing I found myself at Berkshire Hathaway was more or less like I'm an advantageous realtor and I'm just chasing like a star effect. I'm all over the place, right? right? right Where I right. wanted to, and as my kids started to grow and I was missing out on time with them, I realized like something's got to change, right? So Keller Williams have has the systems. They have what they call the MREA, which is the Million Dollar Real Estate Agent. So, uh, they more or less wrote a book that more or less gave you the blueprint to make $2 million a year and you net a million and then you give away a million. So the power of that to be able to actually say to yourself, like, could I actually make this kind of money, which is more than I ever thought I ever could. 
right? right, on an annual basis. And then not only that, could I take half of that income and actually give it away, right? Yeah. And then their mindset is it's not – money is only good for the good that it could do, right? Yeah. And so like the whole ethos behind the brand of what who Keller Williams is – was kind of intriguing and um, just really enticing to me. And everybody there that I've met, and I go to events all over the country and meet brokers from all over the world doing business at the highest level. And it's uh, it's mind blowing because anytime you think, oh, I got big goals, you go to these events with agents who are selling, you know, a <laughs> billion dollars a year. <laughs> you know what I mean? Yeah. And, um, Keller Williams in particular is the largest privately held real estate brokerage in the world. They do wow. more volume and they have more agents than any other brokerage. So it's like, it's just a very interesting company. And so, mm-hmm. uh, that is kind of what led me to, you know, I thought I could, you know, create a team. And obviously once kind of going back into creating, running a business, well, the only way you can expand is, you know, creating leverage through either people or systems. Mm-hmm. And so, Keller Williams has some of those systems and they're teaching, they have taught me how to, how to hire, right. How to, you know what I mean? Um, and then work the systems out. So then I can create more leverage. So I can get more time back. So then I yeah. can actually, you know, the ultimate, I don't know. Success is different for everybody. Right. Right. Um, my right. success is generally, it doesn't matter if I, you know, what my salary is. Sure. I have goals and I try to achieve those goals that have, you know, a certain number associated with them. But at the end of the day, um, success to me is I do what I want when I want with who I want. Yeah. Right. And if yeah. I could do that making a hundred K or if I could do that making a million dollars, like that's successful to me because yeah. we're not, we're not tomorrow's never promised. Right. And so the one thing I don't want to do is have regrets, which I love about my wife is that she will be like, Hey, you're working too hard. You've, you haven't had taken a day off in four months. Your kids miss you like something's got to change. And I was like, you're, you're right. Yeah. And Keller, Keller Williams had that model for that. So now yeah. I haven't worked a Sunday probably in two weeks or two months or two years. And wow. I've taken off a lot of Saturdays because I've now have a team who takes care of a lot of that stuff. And I get the time back and I get to actually, you know, enjoy my family. I love that. I love that, so, man. But there, there's there. And I love the fact that you found, um, a, a partner, that had kind of those same ideals um, that, that, that you had that allowed you to kind of challenge yourself and stretch yourself, but in a way that felt right to you ethically. Um, yeah. That, that is awesome. There are two things I want to dive into. <clears throat> um, the negotiation skills that you developed and then also uh, building a team. But first I want to dive into how did you think about building a team and what are some of the um, tips and tricks that you you got from Keller Williams? Because for a lot of entrepreneurs, even myself, it can feel like rolling the dice mm-hmm. and it can be a very expensive process. And so I'm just curious about some of your lessons learned building out that team um, and, and growing. Yeah, I think the first step, I mean, and generally when it comes to real estate brokerage, uh, they would generally say that your first two hires should either be an admin or should be like a, a buyer's agent, right? Mm-hmm. So I generally went with the admin because a lot of the background uh, paperwork takes up a lot of time. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, I think there's a, not a stat, but there's a number out there. I forget what it is, but a realtor during a transaction has has something like 60 something jobs, whether mm-hmm. it's public relations, marketing manager, uh, HR, whatever, sales, like marketing, like whatever it is, they have a lot of hats you have to wear, yeah. right? And obviously therapists, depending on the situation. <laughs> yeah. But in general, you need to take some of that stuff off your plate that is not income producing activities, right? Mm-hmm. So I used to have my to-do list and then I would write a dollar sign next to anything that actually like create, created income right? That was lead generating. Yeah. And so anything that wasn't that I would give to my assistant, right? Yeah. Or I would, I would try to like create leverage somewhere else, whether you could do that with a cyber backer, which le- is less expensive than having a full-time employee, a mm-hmm. cyber backer or, you know, a virtual assistant. Uh, those mm-hmm. are obviously really popular now. 
So, and you can find somebody working all over the world who can help you with back of the house stuff, work with marketing, work with sales, work with creating systems within your business. Um, We kind of have a saying, we need to be working uh, on our business, not just in our business, right? (laughs) Because most entrepreneurs are working in their business. They don't spend enough time to actually plan, to actually work on the systems, right? And, And create the opportunities of leverage because they're so busy servicing whatever they're doing. And so yeah. I first focused on a, 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 an assistant. So I went through, a, you know, over the years, I've been through a few of them. Uh, I have a good one now who's been with me, I think, four years. Um, she went through a seven-point interview process, mm-hmm. right, that Keller Williams has created. It's called, they have a whole curriculum, which is impressive for a corporation um, called, um, what is it? Uh, I'll it'll come back to me, um, yeah. but more or less, uh, oh, it's called career visioning and it's okay. for the business owners within. So it's all generally for the rainmakers or the director of operations of how to hire and how to find the right talent. Right. Yeah. And so it's as simple as kind of like, say you put a resume out and I didn't do this my, for my first few, but I did it for my, my last two yeah. hires is you put out the job description and then at the bottom of it, you say, um, serious inquiries only text this number with your name or email it to this email address. And then you only interview the people I got. I think my first hire, I went through 400 resumes. My wife helped me because my wife's very type A and she's very thorough. So she helped me get through most of that. Um, And then I more or less picked the top 50 and then I interviewed, I called probably 25 of those people and just took way too much of my time. or I wasn't actually doing lead generating stuff where the career visioning really helped because so say I had another 400 applications for this job role. Well, guess what? There's only 12 people who sent me an email. I interviewed those 12 people because they're the ones who could follow the, the simple instructions. And I even put yeah. it in bold. Yeah. Right. With an, or with like an asterisk. I made it easy for people. Yeah. Right. It wasn't just slipped in there. Um, and so that is one thing that I've learned through Keller Williams is just that little attention to detail. So hired the admin um, and then just started creating systems, right? In real estate, you have to have like multiple systems just like any other business, right? Mm-hmm. You have a, I had a buyer system, I had a seller system, right? How to work with sellers, how to work with buyers, uh, investors, uh, lead generating system, marketing systems, uh, hiring systems, like how do we bring on more agents, right? Yeah. How do we qualify those agents? Um, and we go through the career visioning that Keller Williams has created, which more or less is like a seven interview. Each one takes about an hour. So you're investing seven or eight hours into this person up front. Yeah. And each one, more or less, they have to kind of pass through it to see, hey, do, you, do we want to take this to the next step? Yeah. And what I like about it is one of them is, one of them, you actually look at their, more or less their history of all their either jobs or some of their successes going all the way back to like high school. So were you, uh, you, were you the soccer, were you the captain of the soccer team, right? Were, you know, did you win a spelling bee in eighth grade? Like whatever it is, (laughs) what have been some of your successes, right? And some of your failures. And then there's another one called motivation, which really is helpful. I think is probably the best tool of, of that whole, um, system where you kind of, at, they have they have questions. They have like twenty questions where you more or less ask them, and then you write it on a board, and then you circle consistencies within their life of mm-hmm. what motivates them, and then you kind of drill into what do they really want to do. Well, I really don't yeah. want to hire somebody, invest, you know, who knows, dozens and dozens of hours into them for them to leave in two years because they really want to start a dog grooming company, right? Yeah. Like that's a real yeah. passion. Right. So what I like about it is it it drills into what their passions are, what their goals are, and how will they, how will you, how can I build a world big enough where I, they could live in it and get all the things that they want. Yeah. Right. Yeah. So if I interview somebody in a director of operations position and they say, and I eventually drill down and you know what, their ultimate goal is to make $120,000 a year. Okay. What are you going to do with that $120,000? Right. And so in the interview, we kind of, go and find out what that is. Well, guess what? She wants to start a non-for-profit. 
well, as an employee, if I can help as an employer, can I, if I could help one of my employees actually fulfill some of her personal and lifelong yeah. goals, well, how much more, um, you know, fulfilled is she going to be in the role that she right. feels known, supported, right? And that we're working towards that goal. Well, I, the only way, the only way I'm going to be able to afford to pay somebody that kind of money is, well, I have to hit this many, many sales, right? And so yeah. helping them build it out because at the end of the day, the more money I make, the more money they're going to make. Yeah. So no, I think, I, I love that. Yeah. So I think the first role for any real estate broker is probably to get some kind of uh, assistant um, to help mm-hmm. with some of the transaction management, marketing management, um, and also just kind of the face to face with client on the back end, right? How mm-hmm. many people showed your property this week? What was the feedback? Like, if I don't have to send those emails, if I don't have to make those calls, if I don't have to deal with that and somebody else can, that's great. If I don't have to deal with the attorneys and the inspectors and the appraisers, right? And the loan officers. And I could have somebody else deal with it. Well, then that gives me more opportunities to go out and have coffee with clients, all right, and have more intentionality around the people in my world, all right. And so yeah. you're creating again. What are those lead generating opportunities? And focus on those. So then I can bring in more business and feed it to my team. Yeah, I really, I really like the, <clears throat> I really like the idea of just kind of writing down all the tasks and then put just simply putting a dollar sign saying, "Is this lead generating or not?" Because you know, I come from consulting, so I'm very operations heavy. Like I can whip up systems like no nobody's other, yeah. no one's business. But the challenge for me is I'm thinking about executing those systems myself. Yeah. Um, and then trying to make a decision of, okay, well, on Monday I'm doing this system. On Tuesday I'm doing this system. And of course there's a certain element of, are you in a position to hire? But you know, keeping the eye on the prize and focusing on, can I make money if I keep this activity Mm -hmm. or is this just an activity I don't like doing, right? Those are two very different reasons to find somebody um, to, to, to replace you. So I really like that system that you you put into place. Yeah. And I'm not an operationals person. Like Mm -hmm. I was in, you know, before I hired a full time and I, I think also too, like, to be honest, and I think this is where a lot of entrepreneurs are as well. They don't want to spend the money on hiring somebody full time or somebody they're going to try to find somebody at 35, 45 grand, 50 grand when really the person they want is at like 70 or 80 grand, you know, especially nowadays. Yeah. But for years I tried part time hires and it just never worked out. I probably went through six part time hires Mm. because it it just wasn't aligned. Right. And they had other things and they needed to make more money at the end of the day. Right. Right. And so. I think a lot of times, you know, entrepreneurs, in particular realtors, they go cheap right away. And I get it because I was there. But in hindsight, if I knew now what I knew then, I would have hired somebody full time a long time ago. Hmm. Right. There is a, a great agent in our industry. Uh, her name is Millie Rosenblum. She's been doing it about 40 years, top producer. Um, she used to be the president of the Chicago Association of Realtors. Just a real powerhouse, real smart, uh, good business owner. And she, I heard her speak once at a panel and she more or less said, if you're a realtor selling $5 million uh, of homes a year, which is, you know, roughly, um, you know, 75 to a hundred thousand dollars a year in income, you should have a full-time admin. And I remember when I heard it, cause I was making that much and I was like, Whoa, how can I go and forward somebody to pay them, you know, 40, $50,000. That's half my income. There's no way. But in hindsight, I probably could have made that happen and I should have made that happen because I would be a lot farther along now because it took me uh, probably another eight years or seven years of just doing it on my own, you know, and I was making good income and, you know, the business was growing every year. And generally the rule of thumb for me is always try, can I grow my business 20 to 30% a year? Mm. So, you know, and in five years it doubles, right? So that's, you know, or like conservatively, you know, if that's my goal, then okay. I'm okay with that because I'm in, I'm in for the long run. Yeah, absolutely. uh, And then some people hire buyers agents, somebody help because buyer, when you work with buyers versus sellers, buyers take up a lot more time just because you're showing them eight properties, right? You know, so you're in the car with them for four or five hours versus doing, you could probably show 
a lot of properties on the opposite if you're a listing agent. Yeah. Right. Yeah. And so some some people focus on getting a lot of times agents who start out they're more buyer focused, just mm-hmm. because they're doing open houses, uh, and that's a good way to you know most realtors don't do open houses to sell the house. They do open houses to meet unrepresented buyers. Right. <laughs> right. You know, I think there's a statistic out there that more or less I think something only like seven percent on a national ba- on, a, on an annual basis. Home sell during an open house, seven yeah. percent. They don't actually really, you know, sell that many houses. Yeah. So <laughs> it's 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 fascinating because it comes down to the fundamentals of business, right? Like f- what figuring out that yeah, you're not going to you know hit your conversion or your transaction, but you doing it gives you the leads, and those mm-hmm. leads may turn into um, a number of other. Um, close deals. So, so oh, yeah, it's, it's come back down to the fundamentals. Yeah. My first deal ever was I was doing an open house for a different brokerage on a development site uh, in Lincoln Park and uh, an unrepresented buyer came through. She just so happened to be uh, a doctor at University of Chicago. Um, she loved me, right? I barely knew what I was doing. You know, I'm 21 <laughs> at the time, right? 22. And, uh, she ended up loving me and referred me to multiple other doctors and people. And, you know, it was like one of the best relationships I had in my business because she, mm. after, after we closed and we ended up getting dinner together, I told her that that was my first deal ever. And she was like, <laughs> I would have never have known. Yeah, like you were so awesome. competent and so confident in what you were doing, you know, that I would never have known. And I appreciated all the honest feedback you gave her because, you know, so I think it's just, I hate, I hate the expression, fake it till you make it. But I think at the end of the day, what I did and I think what a lot of good entrepreneurs do is that they invest in themselves. Mm-hmm. So now that's how I, I, I rose to the top or I rose really fast at the board of trade. Um, when I was, I started when I was 18 and I think I stopped trading when I was 21, um, mm-hmm. was because I didn't take lunch breaks. I would sit and just pick all these older traders brains Right, I would meet. I would meet them throughout the day, and they would either like you or they didn't like you, right? Because it was a very tough world down there on on any on any exchange floor. It's very, it's a very boys' locker room, right? Mm -hmm. It's very cutthroat. Like you can't screw up, or you get fired, or you know people just make fun of you. Yeah. And uh, instead of taking lunch breaks, and I would do this, say you work five days a week there, I probably would take a lunch once a week, right? Or I would just eat a sandwich real quick throughout knowing that I would just go and pick these guys' brains because they were still in the pits. And then those guys liked me and they got me jobs, right? Yeah. And then they're like, oh, hey, man, you shouldn't be doing this job. Like, you know, I'd be like, what books should I read? They tell me, I read the book. I go back to them at lunch and say, hey, I don't understand this concept, right? Yeah. I don't understand this hedge or, you know, I don't understand how to create leverage within this trade. And they would talk to me about it and it's like, yeah. you know, and yeah. I think I did that as real as a realtor too, you know, I would pick older guys' brains. I would read books. I would read the Wall Street Journal to help understand what's going on in the bonds, you know, which is going to affect interest rates, which is going to affect, you know, multitude of things. So I think I was just all over constantly just investing in myself. And that yeah. doesn't cost much, right? Yeah. Or during the recession, I think I got, I got like three accreditations during the recession. Things were slow. I got a foreclosure and short sale, a certified negotiation expert. Right, so I focused on what are what is what is important for a good realtor to have is good negotiation skills. Right, so then I went yeah. and got certified in that. And then I became like a seller's representative, like making sure I knew exactly how to market people's homes the best way yeah. possible. Right, I I really like that tactic because I can relate to it. Um, I'm one that you know infamously doesn't take a, take lunch, <laughs> and. But I like talking to people, I like picking people's brains. You know, I have three older siblings, closest ones, eight years to me. So I'm used to talking to people that are considerably older than me yeah. and love just the wisdom they give. And um, we were talking about this a little bit earlier. This podcast is kind of like that for me. right? Yeah. Like it, it's, it's in a world where everything's gone online and everyone is, you know, selling some type of course or some type of framework. For me, I still like the, you know, find a way to talk to a stranger and pick their brain. Um, 
And this podcast has given me the opportunity to just touch people <laughs> yeah. and talk to them and, and learn them, their system. So um, I 100% agree. Like there's, there's wisdom in just carving out the time to invest in yourself in the way that you learn best, whether it's just, you know, people to people, mm-hmm. finding books, taking accredi- accreditation courses. Um, I really like that. Yeah. I mean, even I, I try to push that onto my team and other agents on my team. Now, they're not wired the same way I am. It's sometimes I get some pushback, but it's like I even just uh, had an agent on my team where I was a two day course. She got a lot of like continuing edge ed- education credits for it um, because she was just in like a tighter financial situation. So it's like, you know what? I will pay for it, right? I'll yeah. invest in, in, in you as I continue to do on a daily basis, but like I'm also putting money towards it, right? Yeah. So you could hone your skills. Right. And that's also as a, as a business owner, like, sure. Can I teach a lot of things that they taught her in the class, but I'm also busy. Right. So it's also creating leverage. Like this company will teach her how to be, I think she got a, it's called accredited buyer, like consultant, like ABC or something like that. Um, and so now she, and, and when she came back, she's like, Hey, you know, did you know that we're, we're doing this and maybe we shouldn't be, or, Hey, did you know that we're doing this and hey, we're do, we're really doing well, yeah. right? Yeah. And this and it was just like, yeah, great, right? And so now she has more confidence to go out and do her job better, yeah, because she's just been trained for you know sixteen hours, eight hours a day for two days. If you found this video to be helpful, please like, subscribe, or leave a comment. If you're an entrepreneur and want to share your journey and be helpful to others. Please hit us up on our social media channels, or you can shoot us an email at behelpfulpodcast at gmail.com. Thanks. Be helpful.